Lord. So uh, I want Alex to come real quick here. We're going to pray for him uh, tonight as uh, he gets ready to, 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 uh, to preach. So Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord God, for the word. Our hearts are open tonight to receive the implanted word, which is able to save our souls, able to renew our minds. And Lord, we receive this word, Lord, this implanted word. We say, yes, our heart is open. Our heart is open to receive what you have for us. We are open. We're good receivers tonight. So bless Alex as he ministers the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Good place to be, amen. I would like to know, though, how many of you enjoy getting out and playing on the roads in your vehicles? Like me. How many? Couple, couple hands, two or three hands. That's great. Or who? How many of you detest it? Absolutely hate it. Like my wife back there. Yeah. It gets it gets people stirred up, does it not? At work, uh, I had uh, told, I had sent out a Facebook message on our work group place that uh, if anybody needed to ride to work last week, just let me know and I'll come pick you up. Not one person called me, so they wanted to stay home, I guess. But I absolutely love it. But anyways, uh, just like that gets people stirred up when you talk about having to drive on the roads. I want to stir you up tonight uh, in the Lord. Um, I was uh, hearing from the Lord that he said, open the eyes of your heart. And I heard the song in my head that we sang here before. That was a wonderful prelude to the message tonight. Thank you for that. Um, but I said, Lord, I said, Pastor Paul's pretty much covered the gamut of, the, uh, of that the past several weeks or months or however long we've been. He said, I know that. And he said, he said, but I want you to put a little twist on it with the word open. So I kind of thought, okay, all right, where are you going with this, Lord? So as I began to, to seek his heart, and I thought about the title of the message could be The Opened Door or The Open Door. And I thought about that. And I looked up the word open, as I always usually start out. I love words, and I love word searches and things like that. So the word open means allowing access, passage, or a view through an empty space. It's not closed or blocked up. So you can look at being unlocked, unbolted, unlatched, unfolded. That's what this word open means. It also means not covered. It means exposed. So as I was looking at that, I thought about myself, and I thought about the church, and I thought about, Lord, are we being open to the things that you have for us? Are we being open to our callings? Are we being open to the, the things that you have asked us to do? And a lot of times I believe that we, we become closed off a little bit. I believe we, we are called to certain things, and we'll get into that, a lot of that later too, but we're called to things, but we remain closed up, we remain hidden. Uh, there's things we don't want people to know. Uh, there's things in our life that maybe embarrass us or just happen and we just don't really like, and, and that's just life. Amen, that's just sometimes our mess, and God can work through that. But then I thought about something that I heard God speak to me, and he said, he said but you know what? It's not all about you. Alex. Sometimes we get so caught up in our own lives and the busyness of our own lives and the things that the kids are doing, the things that our work is asking us to do, that we really make our life just about us. But God says there's much more to this than what you have going on. And I thought, God, help me and forgive me for being closed off and forgive me for being hidden. And Lord, allow me to become a uh, an avenue and a vessel for someone in my life and someone in the church and someone at work and whatever. And he's really been dealing with me a lot about these things. So we, what we are called to do is open the door for others as we have had the door opened for us and we walk into things of God. And so that we can go and we can, we can receive love, we can give love, we can serve people, encourage them. That's what it's about, amen? I love it when someone is able to encur encourage me. Whose water is this? Is it mine? Half a bottle of water. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. Anyways, so I thought about, you know, our culture. Our culture is sometimes closed off, amen? It's more and more closed off. It's, you know, we become skeptical towards each other. Um, 
we build bigger fences, higher fences, thicker walls. We kind of isolate ourselves. And I believe that, I mean, sometimes in you know, social media, even though it allows us to extend out and see things that we may not normally see without it, but I think it actually encourages us to be more closed off so that we don't have to go out and talk to people, just send a little, little message. There's nothing wrong sending a message, but if it allows you to be so closed off that you're not reaching out, that's a problem. Amen. I'll take that. My mouth's like cotton right now. It has a lot to do with uh, the tacos that I had, the salty tacos, and being nervous. Amen just what it is so what is the answer what is the answer to our world what is the answer to those that need Christ what is the answer for people we need to know that they are worthy amen we are worthy we are important and we need to be using our gifts and our talents to serve and love others all for the glory of God so I'm going to stir you up tonight to your gifts and your callings and the things that God has called you to that perhaps you're walking in and thank God for you. Perhaps you've walked in it and you haven't been. Maybe we'll stir, yourself, stir each other up tonight to begin some new things and have God to reach out to you. It kind of uh, leads me to this story. And you can turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 28. We're going to look at verses 1 through 10. But this missionary named Logan Wolfram, I don't know if you, you know her or not, but you can see her sometimes on uh, uh, Right Now Media or whatever that's called there. Um, she's a missionary, and she, when she was uh, beginning to go out to one of her, her stations, there was another missionary that had been there for 25 years. So she was excited to talk to her. She was excited to see what all God was doing and uh, she began to talk, and she asked the question, so how did you get started in this mission field? She said, well, she said, the, the tenured lady, she said, I asked God to give me a list of the things that, that he wanted me to do. And she said, well, what was number one? She said, well, number one, uh, God told me to love well the person right in front of me. So she began to tell her about all her experiences and about what she has encountered and the people she has touched and, and so on and so on. And, and when she was finished, she said, okay, I want to know what number two is. You know what she said? She says, I was never given a number two. She said, I've been working on number one for 25 years, and God never gave me another word. I've been loving the people well that has come in front of me for 25 years. And I thought that was monumental. Love people well. Love people with what God has given you in your mission. Love well the person just right in front of you. Um, in Acts, the 28th chapter, there is a lot going on with, the, with, with, with Paul. Um, he had been imprisoned. They'd been sailing from, from uh, land to land, from island to, to island, and... Uh, he had warned, he had already warned that uh, it probably wasn't a good idea to sail, but they didn't listen, and they said, no, we're going to do it anyways. And he said, well, he said, uh, he said, as long as everybody stays on the ship, it's going to be okay. He said, you're going to live if you stay on the ship. He basically says, don't jump off and try to get away because you're going to die. Um, but he said, be of good cheer. It's all going to be all right. There was something different about the Apostle Paul, amen, a whole lot different. But in situations, I mean, think about how many times he had been beaten and how many times he had uh, been you know, shipwrecked and all these different things. But he was al he'd always revert back to what God was saying, what God was going to do, what go how God can affect your life. And that's, that's really what, where we should be at, no matter what situation we find ourselves in, amen. So the uh, people of Melita, or Malta, I believe, uh, was people that, let's just read it real quick. Verse 1, and when they were escaped, they, then they knew that the island was called Melita. They had uh, been shipwrecked there, and actually the, some of the people were hanging off broken pieces of the ship uh, there at the very end, coming to the shore, and some of them was on long boards, and uh, it was just a mess uh, 
but they landed here. And then it said, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. They thought he was going to die. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen up and fallen down dead suddenly. But after that, they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds and they said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laded us or loaded, loaded them with such things as were necessary. There's things in this story that I've never seen. I always heard about the snake and about how it lashed onto him. They shook it off in the fire. And we've preached hundreds of messages about that. But what about what happened on the island and what happened when you know you, you, you get shipwrecked on a, to an island and you, you've heard stories about the barbarians and how unsightly they were and how smelly they were and how uh, how mean they were, cruel, brutal, primitive. Um, that's what these people were. And I think it's interesting that the contrast happened when they were shipwrecked here. They actually showed them a whole lot of kindness, built a fire for them because they was cold and wet. And they, they, were, they were broken and I'm sure, you know, bleeding and, and hurt and, and all kinds of different things. But they brought them in, they, they lit the fire and they warmed them up and they showed them no little kindness. And you go on and you say to yourself, would I have been scared of those people? Would I have been intimidated and not injected myself into their society there? Or would I, you know, would I have kept with just my group? and not associated with the barbarians. But I believe they, when they were showed the kindness, which was great on, on, on the barbarians' part, and I believe this was a God thing, and then they injected themselves into the people there, and you know, some of them had groups probably here and there, and Paul went with this, with this, with this uh, certain uh, person that had him held captive, and they went into the home, and ministry happened. Amen. God had opened up a door for ministry to happen there on that island. But if the people would have, the, 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 I don't know how many of them was, was of God. I know Paul was. I know there was about 200, I think I looked it up, 276 people on that, on that ship. I don't know how many of them was with Paul with, with laying on the hands of stuff. But if they would remain closed off and not went into the house where there was a sick person, that healing would not have happened. Sometimes God wants us to eject ourselves into situations that perhaps intimidate us, but for a purpose. Amen. He's going to arm us. Amen. Number one, he's going to, we need to engage ourselves, not stay back. We need to, number two, be genuine. We need to show hospitality. We need to, to be loving Jesus and to, to love somebody else with, with, with the love that we have been shown. Really what I wrote down here is let your mess be, be exposed. It's okay. Sometimes our, our mess is okay. It's just what it is. Ministry is messy. Pastor Paul, would you agree with that? Ministry is messy. How do I know that? Because I brought my messes to him. Believe me, I've got myself in some good ones. And I'm sure perhaps, hopefully, I'm not the only one. But ministry is messy. Sometimes I need to be ministered to. Sometimes I am the minister. It's just the way it works. Amen. But God is good. Amen. Number four, we need to be real. Be real with people. Number five, we need to show kindness. And the fact that we have a messy life and we bring our messes and 
into other people's lives, uh, that right there is, is a relationship. Amen. When I talk to somebody about what's going on, I'm having a relationship. And I go into my community of brothers and sisters and, and begin to share my life and begin to help them and encourage them and love them like Jesus would. I mean, loving the person in front of me. All those things together, relationship, community, and love, that's a spiritual transaction that God loves. Amen. It's a spiritual transaction, and it's just basically, basically called ministry. Every one of us are ministers of Jesus Christ. Don't let your awkwardness and don't let your mess and don't let your life keep you from loving somebody that's right in front of you. It may just lead to revival. You know, the Apostle Paul not only laid hands on Publius, Publius's dad, but when the island heard of what was going on and him laying on their hands and, and, and him being the healing somebody, then they all came and had revival. Amen. Amen. Healing of the sick, raising of the dead, perhaps. Even, I'm not saying that's in here, but I'm just, you just don't know what would happen. But because the Apostle Paul was open to what God was, was, was preaching through him and, and teaching the people, and he was being hospitable, and they was being hospitable to him. There was a transaction happening, and God was working. God was healing. God was doing what he does, loving the people and showing love, showing the love of Jesus. You know, sometimes uh, ministry, well, I think I've talked to, this, talked to uh, Pastor Paul about this before, but sometimes I, it just feel like ministry is, is, is swimming upstream. Never comfortable, exactly. Always having to fight the current and things coming at you, going downstream. It's easy to go downstream. All you got to do is just sit in the boat and go, right? The, 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 the flow, will, the current will take you on. But sometimes it, you got you to get a little messy. You got to pull your sleeves up and you got to get in there and just fight and, and, and go ahead because, you know, God wants us to be around people that uh, sometimes we're not comfortable around. Uh, those people need the love of Jesus. Amen. Paul heard of their faith. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Scripture's already uh, basically being quoted tonight, but let's turn there and look at this. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 is kind of where we started with all of this. The Bible says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory in his inheritance is. And I, I looked at those things and I thought, I love hope. Being hopeful is, is awesome, amen. It's eternal life. It's our call. It's our justification. It's our glory. Amen, we hope. And in the inheritance that we have in God, the kingdom, the riches of, of grace, grace being bestowed to us, we have a right to all of it. Amen? Sometimes it's hard to, to receive that, but we have a right to the kingdom and all the keys of the kingdom. We have that right to go to it. Amen. It's just like having an open bank, and, and they say, anybody who wants this riches, Come and get it. The door is open. But if we don't get up and we don't go to it, we can't receive it. Amen? It's our ministries. It's the riches of Christ. He, uh, the apostle Paul had heard of the, their faith there in Ephesus. Uh, he heard their, of their love and their faith, and uh, you know, he continues to encourage them. He basically says, Jesus, give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the revelation knowledge of, of Jesus. And then we look and we see in the Amplified Version, the Bible says that the eyes of your heart, the very center and core of your being, may be enlightened or flooded with light by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Flooded with light. I like that. I really like the Amplified Bible. It, it just uh, brings other words. Flooded with light. No room for anything else but the Spirit of God. Amen? It's our understandings. Uh, before Christ, we're dark. 
But when you flood something with light, there is no more darkness. And there is only the things of, of, of Jesus Christ. Amen. I thought about the hope, and then I thought about uh, our eyes and, you know, what our eyes do. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. And I thought about that. The eyes are the windows of the soul. Amen. The eyes are the windows of the soul. You can a lot of times walk around, and you can look into the eyes of people, and you can see the hurt. You can see the despair. You can see that life has weighed them down. And what they need is to be flooded with light. They need a touch and an encouraging word from you. They need you to take them to the side. It don't, it don't take very long, but just take them to the side and just give them a word of encouragement. Say, hey, listen, I see that, I see that you, you, you're a little down. There's something different about you today. I want to encourage you today that the Lord is good. Whatever you need. The Lord can help you with that. Maybe pray with them, whatever it may be. It may be another situation, but uh, the eyes are the windows of the soul. And then sometimes you see the ones that are, that are lit up and are excited and are on fire for the Lord, and, and they encourage you. And it's like iron sharpening iron. I can sharpen you when you're down, and, I, and you can encourage me when I'm down. And, and that's just the way that, that the world works. And the Spirit of God and the riches of Christ work is that we use these things for one another. And then God begins to show us things uh, that we're supposed to do, things that we're supposed to be uh, doing on the earth. And I want to stir you up tonight, and I want to ask the question, what are you doing for the Lord? Now, I have had to ask myself that question, so I can, that's why I can ask you tonight, but what, are, what, are you, what am I doing? Lord, what am I doing? What, am I doing what you want me to do right now? And sometimes I believe that doors are open. I believe the spiritual doors are always open from God. It's always uh, uh, when we think about our callings, God opens those doors and he's like, this is, this is where I want you to go. This is, this is what your calling is. Uh, sometimes I think we need to symbolically go and open that door ourselves and say, all right, God, I know this is what you're leading me to. Uh, I know that you're going to do great things, but I'm symbolically open this door, Lord. And I give my heart to you. I ask for your direction. I ask for your Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me and direct me because I don't want to go there without you. Amen. I don't want to go do anything without the Lord. And sometimes it's a step of faith and sometimes it's a hard step, but the second step's a lot easier. Amen. Only you know what your callings are and sometimes it's not, it's, maybe it's not real apparent. That's when you just go do something, I believe. Do something. You might go do something and thought and think, I thought this was it. Maybe this isn't it. And maybe you go do something else. But I believe that we as a people, like uh, this culture is kind of encouraging to be closed off and to be skeptical of the world. And, and we just sit in a place and, and we're stagnant and we're, we, we, we don't have a lot of things flowing through us. I, I believe that sometimes we can look at ourselves and say, I'm not going to stay here. I might be here, but I'm not going to stay here. God, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to have eyes flooded with light. Show me, Lord, where I am to go. Show me what I am to do, Lord. And then when all of the workings of, of every member in the church are set, it's a beautiful thing. Amen. Amen. And that's us tonight, church. When we're doing what God has asked us to do, we feel good about ourselves and when we work together, we affect someone else that walks through those doors with the dim light, with, with the, the candle that's the wick's been cut off, and they need that fire again. You know, in the Old, Te in the Old Testament, the altar was always had, the fire on the altar it always had to be going. So they had people go in all the time and make sure the fire was stoked and the wood was burning so that the fire of God would always be there igniting things so you could see it. You know, we are those people that keeps the fire going for the Lord. Um, God is just good. Amen. Amen. He is really good. He has blessed us here at Faith Christian Fellowship. And there's so many things to get involved in. And sometimes uh, uh, we, we feel like the Apostle Paul. We've been shipwrecked here and we've been imprisoned here and we've had this going on. But 
all through it all, God always leads us to some situation and some time in our life that we are going to encourage one another, encourage someone for the Lord, because that's really what it's all about. Amen. Amen. Psalms, the 119, verse 18, the Bible says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Open thou mine eyes, Lord, that I may behold beautiful and wonder on the earth. It's simple as asking God to open your eyes. Amen. I believe God extends grace for all of us. Let's talk about our calling for just a little bit. Romans, the 11th chapter, the verse, verse 29, the Bible says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. How many of you have heard that scripture before? I think about that scripture a lot. Because honestly, I've been on and off with my ministry over the years since uh, the year 2000. Brother Jimmy back there was around me uh, back then when I got called uh, to the ministry and was associate pastor at a church down the road. And uh, just a lot of things have happened to me over the, through those years. But there's one thing that I could never say, could never not be, say that God has called me into the ministry. I may not feel <laughs> feel like it. I may not. Uh, be doing a lot, but I could never say, God, you didn't call me. I couldn't say that to God because because God has already said it in his word that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. They're irrevocable. So if you've been called by God to do something, it may not be a five-fold ministry uh, gift, it, 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 whatever it may be, but if God has called you to something, uh, he doesn't take it back. It's irrevocable. Can never be withdrawn. So God's saying, I've called you. I'm not going to let up on you. I'm always going to have the Holy Spirit to encourage you and to stir you up to your calling. I have what you need. I have my word in your heart. I have when you pray to me, I, I, I speak to you and I talk to you and you talk to me. It's a beautiful thing. But where is your calling? Because God hasn't revoked it. God hasn't said he was sorry that he did it or said it to you. Sometimes I was like, God, why me? I couldn't stand up in high school and, and give a book report without you know, sweating and, and having palpitations. And I'm like, how in the world, God, would you use me? But he said, I called you. I want you to be open to me. Give me your heart. I will show you the way. And that's just what it is. Amen. So what is your calling? The Amplified uh, Version says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For he does not withdraw what he has given, nor does he change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. Amen. We are called. What is that? I wrote down uh, the words called, C-A-L-L-E-D. And I began to look up different words and different things, and uh, I thought about the word contagious. When I am walking in my calling, I am contagious. Somebody wants what I have because of what God is doing inside of my heart. I am contagious. I am accessible. I am open to someone coming to me and saying, hey, I know you're different, and I know there's just there's certain things I, I'm not allowed to say around you. And I want, to what, I want to know what you think about this. And you begin to pour out the heart of God to them. I'm accessible. I'm loving. There's not much more we can say. We know what that means. But I am loving. Now, it's inter and it's interesting because I always have to check myself. Because at work, what I do, I work in uh, it's sometimes a high-stress environment in surgery. We have a level one trauma center. There's people coming in with stabbings to the heart and stabbing to the lungs and sh gunshot to the arms and legs and everywhere else. And there's all, all kinds of things going on. Sometimes you know, we're short-staffed, this, that, and the other. And I get caught up in the roughness of the environment where I'm at. And perhaps you have a rougher environment. Perhaps you don't have the rough environment. That's great. But sometimes I get caught up in the flesh, per se, 
you know, a lot of people uh, act certain ways when they're stressed, and, and I got to check myself sometimes and say, you don't have to go along with what everybody else is doing. You don't have to go along with what everybody else is saying. Don't get caught up in the fleshly part of the body, the, the, the stress and what it can do to you. So you always have to check up yourself and say, Holy Spirit, I'm sorry for saying those words. Holy Spirit, I'm sorry for going with that group and, 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 and not saying something or whatever it might be. Um, but Lord, Lord, let me be loving to people. When that patient comes in and they're drug addicted and they're cussing and carrying on and they're calling you every name in the book, what are you going to do? Are you going to punch them or are you going to love them? Are you going to be a professional or are you going to be unprofessional? There's a choice in the matter. Uh, it's, it's just messy sometimes, but that's life, amen. Ministry is messy, but be loving. Be loyal. Be someone you can always go to. Be eager. Be eager to hear the Lord. When he says, go do this, go say that, go, go, go sit down with that person, take that person to lunch. And then the D is, there's three words. I could come up with just one word, so I wrote, wrote three down. Driven, dedicated, and devoted. Be a person that has a drive for the Lord, a drive to know Christ more, a drive to encourage others, a drive to love the person right in front of you. Be dedicated to the... <clears throat> Be dedicated to yourself, to the Lord. Be dedicated to your church. Be dedicated to your job. Show them that we are different than everybody else. And be devoted to your family. Be de devoted to God. Be devoted to someone who needs you. Amen? Are we all right? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll wind this thing down. Perhaps these are just the things that God has been speaking to me lately. But I believe it's a message for all of us that we can use. Consider your calling. What is it that God has called you to do? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Bible says in verse 26, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh not many mighty, not many noble are called. Think about that. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many of them that were called were wise. After the flesh, not many were mighty men and women. This is my version. Not many were very noble at all, but they were called. You don't have to be, let me, I have it written down there, I think. Just consider your calling. Mere, mere worldly standards uh, say you're not very smart, so you'll never make it as a, as a minister or as someone leading people to Christ. You're just not, not smart in that way. Or you're not very powerful. You don't have a very uh, far reach into, into people's lives, so therefore you probably shouldn't be that minister. Or you're not very well known by your name, so you probably really don't have a real big realm of influence because of your name, but that means nothing. You are still the called of the Lord. But by God, we are smart. But by God, we are wise. By God, we are powerful. And everyone knows we are very different from the world. Amen? It don't matter what you are. It matters what God is doing through you. It matters what God has called us to. Amen? It matters. You matter. I think it's interesting that uh, I believe the Apostle Paul said in, in, in Ephesians, uh, one more scripture here, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Basically, there in that scripture, it says, I'm in prison because of my calling. And I say to you, walk tall, walk worthy, walk proudly in your God-given calling. Amen? God is so good. 
going back a little bit, there's some scriptures I want to uh, say tonight, and we'll close. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. When you're talking about our callings, the Bible basically says here that God works all the good things out for us that are called. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 30. I believe the Bible is telling us there, since I'm not there, is there any? Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Basically, God has set our destinies. He has called us, he's justified us, glorified us. And then in the 11th chapter of Romans, verse 30, I believe that God is saying to us, God has called us. We disobeyed, but he forgave us, and he gave us mercy. We are still called. Amen? We are still called. Father, I, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Lord, I thank you for this new season in life. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the new things that you've called us to. Father, I thank you for old things that you've stirred up inside of us. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you're always working on me. And Lord, thank you for extending your mercy and your grace to me. Father, thank you for extending your mercy and your grace to our church. Lord, you are loving, you are kind, you are forgiving. Lord, set us on the right path inside of our callings together, Lord. May we affect the community we serve. May we affect the workplaces where, we, where our realm of influence is, Lord because we all have different reaches. Father, help us to walk inside of our callings. Help us, Lord, to, to love the person right in front of us, Lord, and not worry about the list of things that we are, are, think we have to do, Lord, but just help us to love and to serve and to encourage people. Lord, I thank you for the word tonight that stirs our hearts up to being open and walking through the open doors that you have provided for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for stirring us up to our gifts and our callings again, Lord. Father, make revival happen, Lord, inside of us. And I know it begins with us, Lord. You couldn't, Jesus couldn't come, so, Father, you sent us into the mission field of our communities and into our relationships, Lord. And I thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's what was on my heart tonight. And Amen. Yeah. You know, I was thinking when you were talking, there's a woman that was in, um, the Bible talks about that had an alabaster box. You remember this lady, right? And she broke open that alabaster box. And, of course, the religious were around. Even the disciples said, you know, this thing could have been sold. And look what's happened. And, and Jesus said these words. He said, what this woman has done will be talked about everywhere that the gospel is preached. Amen. Because of one act of being open. That's it. An open heart. Right? An open yeah. heart. Open heart. Just doing something for the Lord, whatever it is. Always being available. And I wrote that down in my notes, and I put it like this. A closed heart is a self-consumed life. Yes. That's right. A closed heart is a self-consumed life. And anytime we have a closed heart, it's because we are self-focused. It's self-focused. And we do. We live in a society today. I was reading an article the other day talking about, it was on a, actually it was a counseling uh, website, and this guy was talking about the loneliness problem in America. That over 50-some percent of people say they're lonely. But yet we have avenues to be more connected than ever. Right. I mean, you know, we have today... You know, I mean, I don't know if you've noticed this on Facebook, but there's a thing on the bottom of Facebook now when you sign in or you go to Facebook, it says Metaverse. Have anybody seen the Metaverse? What they're, what they're wanting to do is to take everything virtual where you would have a headset on and you'd be able to. I just read, I just read an article the other day. Talk, well, actually, it was a guy who was asking questions. He was, a, he was a church demographic guy, and he said, you know, how do you see the church in the Metaverse? Virtual. 
And I'm thinking to myself, the enemy is th- trying to divide us more and more to keep us away from connecting personally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? That's what's happened with our culture today. For against vaccines, it's not my problem. Democrat, Republican, listen, well, all it is is try to divide us more and more. And it's got into the church. It's crept right into the church. I mean, we all have different political persuasions. This is not what this is about. I'm just telling you, if you don't watch out, you'll build fences and not yeah. bridges, Amen. right? Yeah. You'll build walls and not bridges. And the next thing you know, we're off on an island by ourselves. Yeah. So I'm hearing you, man. We have to and stay to open, people. right? Yeah. Not get self-consumed with our lives. Let's get focused on someone else. I thought about another story, Alex. I was, I was sitting there, and I was thinking about when Jesus went to a man that was blind. Remember that? And he may have spit on, it's supposed to mean he may have spit on his, his eyes. Remember? I can't remember, but one of them. And it says he opened his eyes, that man opened his eyes, and he saw men. The Bible says he saw men like trees. Right? He saw men like trees. And then Jesus touched him again, and it says he saw clearly. You know, many times we see people as just resources. Right? We just see people as trees, as just resources, right? You get all kinds of stuff out of trees, right? You get paper, you get wood, you get furniture. You, a lot of times we just see people as resources. But we have to have the Lord touch our eyes again, yeah. right? Open the eyes of our heart, Testimony. right? That we could see truth and see people right. Because there are people. Just like the Apostle Paul, he got off of that boat, right? Mm-hmm. His heart. I mean, come on, could you imagine the frustration? I mean, he's on the boat. They've been, I don't know how many days it was. You back there. It was in a storm called Eurocladon. If you're in any storm named Eurocladon, <laughs> it's bad. I don't care what it is. That's just a bad storm. Yeah. Eurocladon. That just sounds terrible. And they're in there and they're having to throw everything off. And there's right. people trying to get off on the, you know, the, the, the lifeboats and, and listen. They're, and he says, listen, cut them all loose. Yeah. That way, they, if, if anybody gets off this boat, you said it, right? If anybody yeah. gets off of this boat, that we're not going to make not, it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, man, they started coming close to the land. It, hadn't, it had been dark for days with the storm. And all of a sudden, they got close to the land. The Bible says they begin to sound and begin to say, listen, it's getting more shallow and getting more shallow and getting more shallow. And he said, "Listen, hold on, boys. We're going to we're going to put this thing right into the right in you know right into the shore here. Right, right. We're going to run it aground. Mm-hmm. The thing broke up, and they all got off. And it says that some swam and some went on the boards. Right, and yeah. they made it to land. Could you imagine how frustrating it would be? Yeah. Right? Could you imagine you're sitting there warming yourself? <laughs> I mean, right? We've just been through hell, right? And yeah. all of a sudden, here comes a snake out and latches on my hand. Is there anything else, Lord, that you?" <laughs> But he was open enough. These people, these natives, these barbarians, they were open to help. But the Apostle Paul, what if he would have been all mad, like you said, went off to the side? Mm, pouted a little bit. He'd, he'd have missed the opportunity to bless Publius's father. Yeah. Lay hands on a sick man and see him recover. Just stay, let's stay open. Open to our calling. Mm-hmm. Amen. I believe God always gives us a way out. Uh, and when he's, when he's finished with one thing, there's something else that's going to come down the pipe too. The, the, the other boat that was ready to take them to the next place, even though they were transporting the prisoners, it still was going to take them to another destination. God never leaves us at one place. He fulfills that call, leaves us there for a little bit to do what we want to do, and then he'll provide something else for us. We just got so to be as in that he closes place. one door, right. he opens right. another. And no matter where we are in our lives, right, no matter where we are, we need to look for the open door. Yeah. Just keep looking. Just keep your eyes open. Amen? Good word, brother. I really appreciate it. You guys enjoy that today. Come on, let's give him a good. Thank you, man. I want you guys to stand to your feet. I want to get you home before it, it turns into the blizzard out here. That there probably will not happen, right? There's a definite, definite chance of 1 to 79 inches tonight, okay? Amen. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, again, I thank you for Alex and the word. And, Lord, we're open to receive what you have for us, no matter what it is, God. Lord, we're open to our call. We're open to your voice. Our eyes of our heart are open. Lord, I pray that you would touch us, that we could see people clearly. And, Lord, it's that one simple, that one simple act of obedience can change somebody's life forever. One word from God can change your life. 
So, God, we're praying that you would use us. We step out of this sanctuary tonight back into our mission field. Lord, we thank you for the training. We thank you for the equipping that goes on in this house every week, the encouragement. But, Lord, we enter back into our mission field tonight as we go home, we go to our work tomorrow, this week. I pray, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we could see you and see what you're doing in the earth. We say again, Lord, what are you doing? And how can I help? And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys be safe.